Is this thing on? Hello, hello. Welcome to Open Bike Night. I'm your host, John T. Bolds, here tonight with some amazing guests on stage and in the studio to have a conversation with an author who writes the Star Trek that's too big to be captured by a measly camera. We have sharpened our pencils, obsessively collected notebooks looking for just the right one, and chosen from a truly amazing list of fictional universes. And our valued guests on the Open Bike Night stage have come to show their amazing support. Joining me today are my co-hosts, the man who knows that the way to keep the pages turning is a barrel of red herrings, host of Sudden But Inevitable, Jesse. Yeah, when I when I need to pick me up, I just reach for my favorite author, Charles Bukowski. It's just, there's nothing more <laughs> inspirational, you know? And the man who knows that no matter how rough life gets, there are magic words that always make things better. It was all just a dream. <laughs> host of Green Shirt, a newbie's track through TNG, Cameron. The man in green fled across the desert, and the podcaster followed. And tonight, we have a wonderful guest for his first visit to the Open Pike Night stage. A man who has spent time with the Federation, with the Rebels and the Empire, taken rides through mass relays, and explored the streets of Springfield. An author who stays grounded while taking us far away. John Jackson Miller, welcome to Open Pike Night. Hey, I'm very glad to be here, and uh, it's a... It's a comedy themed broadcast, and I, I guess I, <laughs> I, I, I uh, I'm one of those people where you know, people will ask how many uh, concerts have you been to, and what are the great concerts, and it's like, and I, and I end up reeling off, uh, you know, George Carlin, Bob <laughs> Newhart, uh, and <laughs> people are like, no, 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 we mean bands. It's like, no, well, that's uh, probably most of my concert going has been to comedy shows. Ah, yeah. excellent, excellent. Sounds like you got a hell of a list there too. So I, uh, I was a college freshman when we saw Jay Leno and, and wow. that was Jay back before uh, he was on the tonight show. So, I mean, although he was, he, he was, uh, it was, it was, you know, it was the cooler Jay Leno who was on the Letterman show most of the time. <laughs> he only owned one car back then. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a heck of a career there. And we are going to talk tonight about your career and all the seriously, a broad range of thing of stories you've written. So, Cameron is going to start us out. When did you get the writing bug? What got you interested in writing as as something you might pursue as a career? Well, I don't know. Well, not, not necessarily as a career, uh, but, uh, you know, I started writing my own stories uh, on a little Smith Corona typewriter and uh, you're drawing my own comics back pretty much age six, seven. I still got a lot of stuff from back then. Nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, the. Uh, this actually came up here uh, this weekend because the first time that I kind of thought, you know, uh, I can do this because uh, I had been, you know, doing my own, you know, mini comics, my own, my own, you know, eight and a half by eleven notebook paper mm-hmm. comics that I'd been doing with you know, issue numbers and uh, schedule and everything like that. Uh, but you know, I didn't think anybody wanted to actually read them or see them or anything, and. Um, then in seventh grade, there was a writing competition uh, in the uh, in the city of Memphis uh, for both the whole city and the and the county. Uh, and our little tiny school, we you know all we could do is send like you know four people per division, whereas the people were sending like 16, 20, 28. They said, "Well, uh, you know, you look like you have nothing better to do. You can you can get on this team." Uh, and uh, I had already written. A uh, hard-boiled detective short story about a duck. Mm, uh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> and uh, and I, I said, okay, well, I can submit that uh, for the for the fiction division, and then you know do all these other uh, you know your know, challenges that they have because they had like forty word and eighty word and one hundred twenty word and five hundred word dashed. You know all these all these nonfiction prompts that they would have you do. Uh, my writing coach then was a woman named uh, Gwen Rosenbluth. She was uh, one of the teachers. You know, we ended up, uh, I won the citywide competition. I won the gold medal, and it was a literal, you know, not gold, but goldish <laughs> medal mm-hmm. for that. And uh, and our little team won the, the team division citywide. And uh, that was kind of like, you know, I, you know, uh, I, I may not actually be a total, complete, you know, imposter or whatever here. 
and one of the things that's cool about this is, uh, and I and I did a tweet about this and a Facebook post about this this weekend, uh, is that Strange New Worlds, the high country, uh, is dedicated to three teachers from my school. Mrs. Rosenbluth is one of them. And uh, she got her copy the same day in the you know, retirement place where she's at. And uh, she did a she did a selfie with the book. <laughs> and uh, and and, you know, I thought that was just cool because one of the benefits of writing a lot of uh, novels, um, you know, the the um, the uh, thing before the introduction or the the, uh, you know, the um, dedications page, it's cool. But for the first three, four, five novels you write, you're stuck with members of your family. <laughs> <laughs> it's not optional. <laughs> no, you kind of, you kind of got to do this. I mean, in right, in order, you know, the wife, the kids, the, the mother, the father, the sister, <laughs> and, and and you got to go through that, and then you know, prominent people in your uh, creative or business life. And now I'm on like book thirteen, uh, and um. Yeah, I, I sort of was like, okay, let's expand outward to you know, some of the folks that uh, you know you just wouldn't necessarily have thought of in the beginning because you had to get all the you know people who would give you flack about it out of the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but no, I'm I, I was delighted to do it. And another one of the teachers, uh, uh, both both the teachers who are still with us, uh, they've got their copies, and uh, and I was uh, tickled to be able to do that. Um, the one who passed on, I'm trying to get in touch with uh, her uh, her widower. Yeah, that's one of the problems is you get to a, a you know a certain number of years, it gets really hard to find people. Sure. Yeah. Are they uh, Star Trek fans at all? Do you know? Ms. Well, Rosenblum? you know, that's the 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 one that passed is uh, her name was Burnsy, uh, and, and we called her Burnsy. Her name was Ellen Burns, but we called her Burnsy, and we think she wanted that n nickname by uh, uh, on purpose because. She would bring in the VCR into the classroom, mm. and of course, you know, uh, one of the things she showed us was the movie What's Up, Doc? Uh, okay. But it stars Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, and yeah. Barbara Streisand is a character named Burnsy. And so we assumed that she set this movie up so that we would give her the nickname. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Barbara, she's a New Yorker, and, and, uh, and uh, this is down in Tennessee. She's a New Yorker, and, and, and she was a former nun. Uh, she actually left the convent and became more or less a new age flower child sort of person. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, she was, uh, she, she was writing a book called uh, Breaking the Habit uh, or, or wow. Kicking the Habit. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in class, uh, you know, she would have us do, uh, we all had pillows that we brought to the class because she would have us do guided fantasies where, you, you know, she would give us writing prompts and while we would sit down and imagine, all right, you're getting larger, you're getting larger, you're getting, you're getting bigger than the entire building, you're getting bigger than the entire uh, 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 city, you're growing larger, and, and, and you know, now what are you going to write about? And of course, you know, I, I couldn't take anything seriously. My buddy Bob couldn't take <laughs> anything seriously. Uh, uh, she loved comic books. She, she uh, loved uh, science fiction novels. She uh, she taught Bradbury to us, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Fantastic. and, um, you know, she, uh, you, you know, later on, uh, you know, I would, uh, write my, uh, essays. I would say, can I do this in comics form? Can I do a comic book version of this? And she would say, absolutely. And I would, I would, I would, and I would do it. And I still have some of those too. So I have, a, you know, I, I have the fall of the house of Usher in my files here somewhere <laughs> as performed by a troop of funny animal characters. Yes. Um, and Tell me that's going to hit Instagram, right? right? Like, well, I need it. I need, I need to, I need to get it out someday. Uh, I've got it. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, she ended up moving to California uh, and, and moved to San Diego and was, working teaching uh, teaching kids uh, english uh, down in the barrio uh and uh and you know as i say she uh, i i saw her uh, the very first year i went to san diego comic con as a guest um and uh and saw her there and you know that was that was wonderful and again she passed a few years ago and um you know, the uh the actual um the actual uh, dedication says that's dedicated to her memory because she she loves science fiction, uh, comics, and fantasy, 
and she would have found no memorial cooler than getting mentioned in a Star Trek novel. So uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that that's true. I think so. It sounds like she earned that uh, dedication. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah. Well, let's jump into Michelle's question. Yeah, that's actually a really good lead in. Hey, Open Pike Night. I'm going to start with my Crusher connection this week because I just want to thank author John Jackson Miller for the way that he wrote Dr. Beverly Crusher in his novel, The Hall of Heroes, which is book three in the Prey series for Star Trek The Next Generation. She was strong and smart and playful in the scenes that she was in, so I really do appreciate her characterization there. And spoilers for the Litverse prior to 2019, um, Picard and Beverly were married with the son. And so I appreciate that uh, you had acknowledged that as the author of this book. And it was just nice to read. So thank you. My question is about your Star Trek experience. Uh, do you have a memory or uh, a time when you remember encountering Star Trek in the comic book world or in the literary world for the first time? And what kind of inspires you to continue to write in the Star Trek universe? I know writing for franchises can probably be a little tricky. So I'm wondering uh, where your inspiration comes from and how you prepare to write a novel like The High Country for Strange New Worlds. Do you um, study the characters? Do you get notes from producers? How does it all work? And uh, what is it that you enjoy about it? So thanks for coming on and answering fans' questions. Live long and prosper. Thanks for the question uh, and the kind words. I think the first Star Trek book I ever got uh, was the Star Trek puzzle book, which was a little you know, thing uh, from, I guess it was, I guess it was Pocket Books. It might have been Valentine. I'm not sure. Uh, I assume it's po Pocket Books. But uh, it was uh, one of these, you know, you know, quiz things where they scramble the titles of the uh, episodes and things like that. <laughs> things I could not possibly have known uh, <laughs> at age 10 or whatever it was, but at least I was able to connect the dots or whatever it was that uh, was on there there in some of the other puzzles. I still have that book. I should crack it out one day and see if I fare any better at some of the, uh, <laughs> at some of the questions. Uh, but, uh, but there was that. And, um, you know, I think the first Star Trek comic book I got would have been, just a random issue of the Marvel series the first time around. Uh, hmm. And that would have been following um, uh, Star Trek, the motion picture. I think at that time, again, it was just not where my head was because I was a Star Wars, uh, you know, uh, zombie. I was buying everything for that. Um, and also I had not seen the motion picture yet. And my first novel that I got for Star Trek uh, was the Klingon Gambit. And I think that was the second of the numbered novels uh, when they, uh, when Pocket started doing the, you know, num you know, Star Trek number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, you know, that's distinct from, from the log books, which, uh, which were out there. Uh, now to actually you know, get into, you know, how you prepare to do one of these things. I mean, my first Star Trek novel takedown I wrote my editor and said, hey, I want to do the uh, the hunt for Red October with Picard chasing Riker. Uh, and, and you know, and it was more or less at that point just a matter of getting uh, the plot figured out and uh, getting it past CBS and CBS making some notes and at making some suggestions and the editor making notes and suggestions. Uh, likewise, the Prey trilogy, you know, uh, it was a big sprawling thing. But it was not something where there was anything to collide with because it was still 2016 and there wasn't anything to collide with. There was nothing new that mm -hmm. was coming out. Um, but then, uh, you know, we have kind of this break where we go into the streaming series uh, shows. And uh, the first novel I write for that is uh, The Enterprise War for Discovery. And with that one, I was specifically asked, tell us where Pike and uh, Spock and number one were during the uh, Klingon War. Tell us where they were during the first season. And that's and so, you know, that was not something where I would have dared to offer that idea <laughs> because I would have assumed it was off limits. What followed after that uh, was a call with uh, Kirsten Beyer. And Kirsten was in the writer's room at Discovery. She had written episodes. Uh, and she had been one of the authors, she is one of the authors 
of the uh, of the Star Trek novels uh, for Pocket, uh, or which is now Gallery Books, you know, she will suggest, okay, yeah, this is when a book can be set. You know, there are rounds where you know she 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 reads every plot, she reads every um, manuscript, uh, and I'm I'm also you know talking with Kirsten about, um, well, is there anything that we could throw in here that will tease the show? Um, oh, okay. And so, for example, we did that in Die Standing, where uh, the sparring partner that uh, young Giorgio had in the Mirror Universe, San, uh, San's first appearance is in Die Standing. Um, okay. I did not create that character, oh, okay. but the novel came out before that episode aired. Hmm. Uh, Very cool. And uh, and so, uh, you know, there are those kinds of opportunities. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, they 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 don't work. Um, there was a, a we tried to do this in Enterprise War, where uh, there's a character uh, whose name I cannot remember now in my book, <laughs> but but the character was going to be one of the other officers on the Enterprise, and mm. I I put her in 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 the book, and I had pulled that character from the Tribbles episode of Short Treks, mm -hmm. and. Mm. Uh, what happened is in between me turning in the novel and them shooting the episode, they changed the character's name <laughs> and that's fine. It still works. But, uh, you know, if you go back and check my social medias you know, <laughs> back, back in 2019, I was saying, Hey, yeah, get ready. We might actually see something kind of fun here. And you know, didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you use conditionals. Like we might see something fun here. Just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, John, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, as a writer, you obviously uh, tell stories with your answers. Now that bleeds over even into your website, where every <laughs> yeah. entry has its own story. You, it's it's a great like it was great for us to do well, research. There's every, so much. Everyone up until I ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. Yes, you're still yeah, and and it's so incredibly generous to see yeah. like i was reading through the website i'm like man there's there's a whole novel yeah. here too this is great well, yeah i think the kenobi one is like ten thousand words and <laughs> yeah i think when i when i sell the 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 giant knights of the old republic uh um oh, where's it back there the giant knights of the old republic omnibus which is 57 stories i'm able to say hey there's over a hundred thousand words of director's commentary with this if you just go to the site yeah um, yeah. My problem has been that um where I really you know, sort of tapped out on it was um with the with the with the Prey trilogy because the Prey trilogy took me an entire year and mm. uh if there is so much stuff you know in a chapter by chapter you know mm -hmm. uh uh you know retelling of how we came up with things that I just decided I would skip it <laughs> and I would skip all the novels that I had done after that, uh, and at least get enough stuff up so that I could get, you know, my 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 you know my website redesigned, <laughs> which mm -hmm. which is what I was doing. <laughs> I'll get to it. I appreciate that people uh, you're enjoying that, and it's just I keep saying the downtime between books, and there's never a downtime these days because you <laughs> sure. have to immediately go into proofreading it and everything, and then promoting the previous book, and then you got to promote the next one and. Oh, I will get to we it. We've got to give this guy some acolytes, you know? <laughs> yeah. Let's get our next question. Here's Abby. Hey, hey, Open Pike and John Jackson Miller. Uh, so glad to be able to speak to all of you again and hope you're all well. I love me some Star Trek books, and I was just wondering if, Mr. Miller, you could talk a little bit about how much you think about and consider canon when you're writing and how much you are considering beta canon and how much you're just like, well, we could never do this on screen, so I'm going to put it on the page because then you can imagine it to the giant heights that you can in your own brain. I've always wondered about this, and I've wondered about if you have to check in with anybody who's on current shows or anybody who's like a, a canon guru to make sure that the things that you're doing are okay. So thanks again for all of the wonderful things that you all put out into the universe. Talk soon. Well, thanks very much. Um... What I uh, do is we have to abide by whatever the source document is, whatever the whatever the uh, franchise I'm working with is, 
Uh, in this case, with Star Trek, it's the film material, it's the screen material. The, everybody sort of decided we're, what we're going to do is we're going to respect each other's content and we're going to build a, a sort of expanded universe, to use the Star Wars phrase, from it. And, uh, you know, that kind of really, you know, starts developing in 2000, you know, with the, the, deep, the deep, deep Space Nine reboot uh, that happened over there. And, and mm. so people start building on other things. And so that is why when I get to writing uh, the Prey trilogy, uh, yeah, Jean-Luc Picard is married to Beverly and they have a son. Uh, and, uh, and all of these other, you know, Data is, is gone, but he's sort of back. And you know, all, all the other things. And, you know, one of the things that I would do every time we would start is I would say, can you send me a list of everybody who's on the ship? Um, you know, all the, all these other alternate characters. And then I would try to use them because even though, um, you know, the hardest characters to write in, in these sort of shared universe prose things are the characters that other people have created, especially mm. if they have been, you know, written by more than one person. And so, you know, they may not actually have a consistent voice necessarily throughout. I love doing fun things like pulling characters from the deep, deep past, <laughs> pulling characters where somebody's going to go, wait, was that intentional? Uh, and, and I, I really try when possible not to do anything that's going to overwrite anything that anybody else has done. Even if, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I've been told it doesn't matter. Uh, or even if it's a case of, um, you know, it's completely inconsistent. There's no way to, no way to respect this. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, uh, the Enterprise War has a, a significant sequence dealing with the fact that the Enterprise can't keep a chief engineer. And this is because if you go back, and I did, I counted off and named every engineer that I had found, a uh, chief engineer in all of the previous books <laughs> and comics. Um, <laughs> all the way back. And I mentioned them all. I even allude to the fact that Scotty at one point was considered to be the chief engineer in one story, even before Strange New Worlds. And hmm. so there's a reference to Scotty having come and having gone, <laughs> uh, but not having been chief engineer, although he thought he was, uh, <laughs> or some line like that. Um, so I, I've got that going on. So, you know, um, uh, you know, chief, uh, 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 chief engineer, you know, moves with burning grace from the, uh, Star Trek, uh, uh, early voyages comics that came out from Marvel, uh, I think, you know, 16 issues or so in, uh, 1990, uh, 97, uh, you know, is mentioned, um, a, another character from that, uh, uh, Gabriel Carlotti, she's the nurse, uh, in early voyages, I gave her a more significant role than that. Um, and she's got not just name drop. She's, she's got a, she, she's a plot point. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's, she, she's in there. And it was just like, why not? Uh, why not? Yeah. Look, uh, authors are always going to refer to their own, um, work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so with Star Trek, so we've had the Coda trilogy, which resets everything that happened in that Deep Space Nine era, uh, everything following um, uh, spoilers, I guess. Uh, but but it you know basically basically it 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 puts into an alternate reality everything that uh, follows a certain point in the universe. Well, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, as I read that, my main character, my main villain from the Prey trilogy still exists. And so anybody who reads um, the uh, the novel, uh, that could, because that character existed before that moment, anybody who reads the, uh, the Rogue Elements novel, that's the Picard novel, Rogue Elements, we meet a Klingon or we meet a holographic Klingon who is his father, the villain. That's actually perfect because our next question is specifically about rogue elements. That's good. <laughs> if you want to, if you'd like to cue up Peter, John. Here we go. Hi, it's Peter again. 
Thank you, Mr. Miller, for being a guest on Open Pike Night. I enjoyed reading your Picard prequel novel, Rogue Elements, for a recent Trek Book Club discussion, and I have a couple of general questions about the book writing process. Rogue Elements was a Cristobal Rio-centric story, which was a relatively light-hearted romp through a series of his adventures before we meet him in Picard Season 1. When you were first thinking about writing this book, what made you decide to focus on Rios, and what led you to adopt a more comedic tone for the book? Was that something you had in the back of your mind for some time? Was it suggested by someone else, like a publisher or colleague, or was it due to something else? Congratulations on Rogue Elements winning the Scribe Award for Best Original Novel Speculative Fiction at last year's San Diego Comic-Con, and I look forward to reading The High Country. Thanks, and live long and prosper. Well, thank you, Peter. You know, what, what prompted me to do it uh, is actually, it was none of those things. It was global catastrophe. Uh, <laughs> it was, well, I, I, okay, I had written um, Die Standing, which was an incredibly dark book. Uh, it was a, a humorous book. It's funny. Uh, the characters in it are more insulting than any characters I think have ever been in a Star Trek novel because it's Giorgio uh, and, and and everything. But I I I actually I was not really well that fall. I was I was I was in her head uh, all the time, and she's constantly, constantly, constantly sarcastic and conniving and 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 distrustful and scheming. And uh, it was just a, a not a fun place to necessarily be. Although uh, it, when that book went for the, uh, for the scribe itself, uh, I, I thought, well, this doesn't have a chance because we're now in the middle of the pandemic and this is way too dark. When I got the call to do a Picard novel, uh, I had seen the, the first few episodes of the series and I said, um, I'll do a Picard novel if and only if I can do Rios. And uh, uh, the uh, editor, Margaret Clark, said, well, you're in luck. That's exactly who we want you to do. <laughs> uh, and then we get on uh, the phone uh, with uh, with Kirsten, who is the co-creator of the series. And I say, okay, Rios is the character in the book. I, I want to do this really one way. This book has to be absolutely so light that it has to be kept underneath a paperweight at all times <laughs> um, because everybody's lived through all of this. And um, I cannot have another book where the body count is as high as it is in not just Die Standing, but Enterprise War before that. And then the Prey Trilogy before that, where there's just bodies everywhere. Yeah, the, the Prey Trilogy has essentially the Battle of the Five Armies in it. Uh, so, except it's a fleet action. Um, uh, so let me I'm go like, Google okay. and order that trilogy right now. Oh, you Sold need to. That. <laughs> and the High Country has maps in the front of it. Oh, Cameron, that's all. So you're, yeah. yeah, the High Country's got maps as well. Like so, yes. so, uh, so, so basically I was like, all right, this has to be light. And so I, I went and I looked at the other light episodes, uh, of, of, of the shows and, I immediately landed on a piece of the action, uh, mm -hmm. which um, I had a connection to because I was born the night that that episode premiered. Hey. Uh, or actually, I was, I was born a couple of hours before, so I didn't see it at the time. But still counts. <laughs> but uh, but yes, yeah. Fizben and I arrived the same day, um, and so uh, I wanted to do a story which is about book collectors in the 24th century, and mm -hmm. and this this will be a story about why physical books, why physical collectibles of any kind are still valuable. Uh, that allowed me to, uh, you know, go on all sorts of riffs because, you know, my, my original career before all of this was uh, I worked for the world's largest publisher of hobby magazines and books, uh, Krause Publications. Wow. So uh, I was running the comics magazines but we also had, and I also, I also ran the card game magazine Scry. Uh, but uh, I, you know, we also had records and and military vehicles and uh, coins and sports cards and guns and you name it, anything anybody ever collected. Uh, you know, we had a book for or we had a, a magazine for. 
uh, and uh, it allowed me to actually riff on some things. And then I just, I love Rios from the beginning because he wants absolutely nothing to do with life anymore at the start of this book because he's been thrown out of Starfleet. He doesn't know why. And he just wants to crawl under a rock and drink himself into oblivion. And, um, you know, I get to, uh, you know, I I had said, you know, you know, to Kirsten, I said, can I tell the story of how the holographic versions of Rios come about? And of course they come about because, you know, he, he, he wants to be alone and he must have had a terrible crew uh, <laughs> to want to actually <laughs> deal with this another way. So, uh, yeah, we have the sort of canon adjacent answer to how he got the ship and uh, mm. and where the holographic uh, Rios's came from. And uh, I got to the end of it and the body count uh, was uh, just uh, two. And um, th- that was more than I was expecting. And I think previously the only book that was even less than that was was Takedown uh, because, you know, one of the plot points of the book has to do with the fact that, you know, the people that are doing the things that are in the book are not going to hurt anybody. But, uh, but yeah, actually, I, I literally say in the, um, in the Acknowledgements of Strange New Worlds that, um, you know, I, I, I wrote Rogue Elements to be a, a, a you know, relief for a world that was dealing with a lot of terrible stuff. And, uh, and, and I opened the Acknowledgements of this book by saying, okay, let's try this again. Uh, <laughs> this this That's novel cool. has some heavy things in it uh but it's also uh it should be an easy read well yeah. on the topic of making a, a bit of a personal connection and you know realizing yeah maybe we all just need a breather i think it's a good time to cue up our next call from our friend sinicera what is up open pike night since sarah proud to be back on the stage once again and welcome john jackson miller to the studio I just spent the last couple of days reading The Enterprise War, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Everyone else should go pick that up and enjoy it, too. I won't get into details of it because I don't want to have a spoiler warning tagged on to my time here on the stage. <laughs> but I'll get into a few things. One, I pr- deeply appreciate, Mr. Miller, that that lame line from Season 2 of Discovery that Enterprise's mission was just too important to come back for the Klingon War <laughs> has been retconned into... No, they were just busy going through an acre upon acre of shit. (laughs) And I'm so glad that we got to know Connolly a little bit better for after his brief appearance in season two. Though now that I've read his story, I really wish that he could have been alive until the end of season two and given us a nice line during that big, beautiful battle of, boy, it sure would be nice if we had a boundless battle suit now, don't you think? (laughs) A little bit of... Firefly riffing there, and I hope you enjoy that. <laughs> Other than that, I'm really excited to read the High Country and anything else that you can you can bring us. Maybe while we're talking now, you can tell us what else is in store in the in the pantheon of Star Trek audiobooks that are yet to come. I've enjoyed a few in the last couple of days, thanks to Green Shirt. So, and that's my time, folks. Glad to be back. Let's live long and prosper. <laughs> well, I'm glad for the mention of audiobooks because I um, I really have realized that so many people are consuming these books by audio now. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give away numbers, but uh, it's it's enough to have changed the way that I write. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. doing Enterprise War, um, you know, I knew that Connolly was going to, um, you know, I guess, spoilers, but you know, in the first episode of the season, he's... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bye bye. Uh, and I, I'm like, well, this is perfect because I can do whatever I want with this character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he starts off in the show as uh, arrogant and cocky, and that kills him. Well, I can show how he got that way. You know, I can give him whatever pursuits that I want, and of course, this ends up, you know, taking him into baseball, <laughs> which is. But uh, again, uh, I didn't put that in for, um, you know, for fun. Uh, It actually was relevant to the way that the Boundless function, the the franchise system in Major League Baseball, the trade system in Major League Baseball, the farm system in Major League Baseball is almost exactly the equivalent of the organization uh, structure of the boundless, uh, and and Connolly as somebody who knows the history of the game 
gets it. And so, uh, you know, that's, uh, that was, that was fun to do. So yeah, I, I was able to sort of, uh, 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 you know, fill that in. I actually have been working most of this winter on a nonfiction book, which is not announced yet. I do have uh, a couple of essays that are going to come out. One is about uh, Star Wars uh, and sort of the expanded realm around it. And the other is about Star Trek. And uh, I wrote the essays about uh, Star Trek and canon and Star Wars and canon. Oh, and man. and <laughs> and and how these two things, uh, these two shows, uh, sort of you know wrap around each other, responding to one another and reacting to one another, and taking ideas from the other, not mm-hmm. on screen, but in terms of how they function behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what is licensed, what is not how the rules of the licensing go. Those are coming out. Uh, no no uh, release dates announced for those. I just need to actually get through it. I, you know, last week was taxes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are you saying, are you saying writers procrastinate? Is that what you're saying to us right I'm now? Saying, I'm saying, Never heard those well, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying that uh, it's, yeah, uh, I wish I had time to procrastinate. <laughs> Seriously, no kidding. No, I don't because mean to I'm, sound I'm, I'm running, uh, I, I, you know, I don't just, I don't just run my, my career. I also run a website called Comicron, which is the uh, world's largest database of comic book sales mm. figures. So I, I'm doing a whole lot Dang. of, st- I, I've been doing that for 15 or more years uh, on the web. Um, and longer before that. Um, but I mean, you know, so I, ma- I manage that, you know, also writers today are having to do a whole lot of, uh, self-promotion, uh, mm-hmm. and mm. social media and conventions and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Kate wrote in, uh, she asked, would you, uh, like to write more novels about Pike's enterprise time during the cage era, or would you prefer to continue writing novels in the strange new worlds era? Uh, you know, if there is a case where we've got access to the folks doing the new shows, uh, and mm-hmm. there's a way to actually get something that is not for a niche audience, but yeah, is able to go everywhere. Uh, and, you know, I, my, everything I know about this book tells me it is a bigger opening launch than I have had for a Star Trek novel, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. in terms of, uh, where it's going and where it's going to be on sale and how long we've had to promote it. Uh, and uh, because it is like three months later than we intended to do it. Uh, and also uh, in the sense that it's less of a niche novel um, than even the ones that I've done already. Um, Enterprise War is sort of set in the past, if you think about it. I mean, it's mm-hmm. in between two shows. And if you don't know those two shows, that might be too, you know, that might be harder for the brand new reader to to come at. Uh, even the Rios book. Um, yes, it's about one character and it's not the main character from Picard. Uh, you know, the, 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 the number one question is random civilians ask when they see the cover of, of, uh, of, the, the, of the Picard novel, which has, you know, uh, Santiago Cabrera on the cover. <laughs> the first thing they ask is, is that Picard? And I'm like, no, it's not Picard with hair. I'm sorry. What would, what would make you think that? And then this number two thing that the civilians ask is, is that you? And I said, why, yes, it is. How kind of you exactly. to say. I, 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 I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, even that is, is some, that takes a, that takes a sentence to explain. It's how Rios, it's, it's set before the originals, or it's mm-hmm. set before Picard. This doesn't yeah. take any explanation at all. Have you seen the commercials for the series? You're in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You I know mean, what a spaceship is. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, you're, you're done. You're ready to go. And, nice. uh, and I, I like that opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's nerve wracking. Uh, sometimes if, uh, you know, the franchise is really moving fast. You know, there have been occasions, I haven't had any such occasion with Star Trek comic series uh, I had planned 
uh, in another franchise was Deep Sixed, uh, more than one, hmm. uh, because it just could not be done once we started doing it and realized, okay, they're going a different direction now. Um, and, you know, novels as well. I'm well aware of the occupational hazards, <laughs> but I also um, have been at this long enough that I you know, am pretty good at coming up with things that are not going to uh, be overtaken by events, you know, when there's a chance that I can future proof the story um, as well so that it doesn't immediately get overwritten by something that comes along <laughs> later. Um, you know, that's, that's really kind of the same, same job. Almost everything that I've done, uh, you know, for Star Wars or Star Trek still works where it is. Mm -hmm. When you get into trouble with these things is, uh, and, and that, that comes up in my, my essays in those books I was talking about. Um, you know, you, you, when you start messing with life events, you know, it, you know, once Han and Leia had their children in the expanded universe, uh, once Chewbacca, you know, uh, uh, buys mm -hmm. it, um, <laughs> well, you know, you've, 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 you've basically lost your security deposit at that point. <laughs> yeah. That's why you it's write a, a Q-shaped shadow in the end of every one of your books. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have one last question from a uh, first time caller to the Open Pike Night stage. Hi there, Open Pike Night. This is CK Holmes at CK Stories on Twitter. I love your show, especially your interviews with Dr. Aaron McDonald and Nami Melamod. And I am super excited to learn that you're having John Jackson Miller on this week. I have a question for Mr. Miller that has been burning in the back of my mind for, well, approximately ever. So let me start by saying that I have been a Star Trek fan for about 33 years, and I'm 35, so do the math. Uh, and ever since I could read, I've been writing stories. So when I was in around middle school age and discovered that there were Star Trek novels, I decided that I was going to write one. That became a lifelong hobby of writing fan fiction. I'm Celtic not on AO3 and still still writing, uh, but it has always been a dream of mine to actually publish an official Star Trek tie-in novel. How do you get tapped for something like that? Live long and prosper, everyone. Bye. Thanks for the uh, you know the kind words and you know, always you know keep writing. Uh, that's 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 the key. Um, you know uh, the way that you phrase that. How do you get tapped? Uh, that is a properly passive phrase because <laughs> there's no action that you can take that will get you tapped. Most of the actions that people think will get them tapped will not get them tapped. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's the, the way of it is um, it, it, it's invitation only. And what happens is they hire you because they know you from something else. And they have seen that you have managed somebody else's property uh, or somebody else's franchise ably and hitting your deadlines and not ruining, you know, the characters and not, you know, setting yourself on fire on the internet, things that are going to reflect well on the brand. So the first Star Trek thing I did was a novella uh, called Absent Enemy. So, you know, always start smaller. I always try that myself. It's better to start with a short story than a novel uh, in any event. I got that connection because Ed Schlesinger, lead editor for the, uh, uh, you know, the, these licensed titles, Ed used to work with the fiction editor at Lucasfilm. And I had just written, uh, I don't think it had even come out yet. I had, I had written A New Dawn, which is a novel tying in with the Rebels TV series. Hmm. It was clear that because of Disney's purchase, the tempo of novels was going to change. And it was not going to be mm. monthly like it had been for a long time. <laughs> and she recommended me to Ed. I got Star Wars prose because I had been doing Star Wars comics. Recommended me to uh, Shelley Shapiro at, uh, at Del Rey after I had been doing Knights of the Old Republic and, and other things at, at Dark Horse for a while. I got uh, Star Wars comics because I had written Iron Man at Marvel. And I happened to be in uh, Portland, Oregon for a family reunion. And I dropped by the Dark Horse office, which I could do because I was also uh, editing those magazines for comics. And so I had a reason mm. to go and I took the tour and everything. And at the end of it, I said, 
is that Randy Stradley in the office over there? Can I go say hi? Uh, <laughs> and and we had this conversation. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, I got uh, Iron Man because I had done Crimson Dynamo, which was a uh, a series at Marvel, which was sort of a a new talent uh, search kind of a thing. And I got the chance to do that because you know, I uh, a, a gentleman who just uh, stepped down from Newsarama after 25 years. He he uh, founded the site. Uh, Mike Duran. He had worked briefly at Marvel uh, in uh, in uh, in the year 2002. I had uh, I had worked with him before. On he had uh, done a column for a magazine. He contacted me and said, "Hey, we're looking for people to pitch for this thing, and I know you happen to you know know how to hit a deadline." And and so it was one thing after another. And and, of course, and I and I. How did I get the magazines for comics? I edited a line of magazines for the lumber industry. Uh, so it was, it was what it was. It's a it's a long case of showing that you know how to you know hit a deadline, communicate. The folks who want to go and say, "Here, let me give you my novel. Please take it." <laughs> I'm not legally allowed to look at it. They're not legally allowed to look at it mm-hmm. because. Um, what happens if they put out a book that looks like your novel that you had nothing to do with? Um, you could sue um, mm-hmm. if they ever read that book. And uh, and so uh, it is the case now that, you know, even Marvel, you know, they've got an idea submission agreement. They can't look at anything you've done unless you swear that, you know, anything they ever do in the future that looks like it is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's because it's not their, you know, they 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 solicited this content from you. They they if you're if you're somebody they went and they hired. I know that that is is disappointing, because just about everybody has a a Star Wars or Star Trek or some other kind of a novel in them. But at <laughs> the same time, I have also written tie-in fiction for things that I never thought I had uh, an, a a book in me about. I wrote a graphic novel for The Lion King, and I had never even seen the movie. And, you know, they hired me to do it, and I saw the movie, and I said, okay, I know how I can write a story about The Lion King. And it's basically, it's, it's, it was a graphic novel for kids. Uh, you know, it was, it was the case where I'm the hired gun who knows how to handle uh, you know, the continuity, and, and it is in Lion King continuity. I did a graphic novel for the Dumbo movie. It's in Dumbo continuity. Uh, it, <laughs> which one? Uh, which one has a higher body count? <laughs> so, I think about that. The uh, Lion King. There's got to be some yeah. hyenas. Yeah. So what uh, I'm hearing is John Jackson Miller continuity cowboy. <laughs> uh, Wrangler. Uh, you know that that, that could be it. Um, and and uh, yeah, the thing the thing that's nice though is it is the case that the number of opportunities for these things have have gone down in terms of the number of you, while while the while the relative importance of uh, and relevance of the novels has increased, they're more tightly connected to the shows. They are fewer mm-hmm. in number uh, in many franchises. But while that's the case, there are also a lot more shared universes out there doing this kind of thing. I just mentioned, you know, two uh, mm-hmm. uh, which you would have considered as <laughs> having expanded universes. But I mean, I've done I've done things for video games, Mass Effect, Halo. Um, uh, I I just did with a friend of mine. Uh, we we wrote the comics for a series. Uh, we wrote the comic series for a, a, a video game uh, called Skull and Bones, which is coming out from Ubisoft mm. at some point. Uh, it's their it's their pirate uh, video game. Uh, the comics are done. Mm. We're waiting for them to finish the game. You hit your deadlines. You know, th- there are a lot more opportunities. For somebody who knows how to do what I'm doing, it's just they're not all necessarily for your favorite show. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, you do need to learn how to do that for any show. I will say you don't, you know, you're going to you are going to succeed more if you are the in the audience for the show or if you're a fan of it. It's one reason I dialed back on uh, uh, Mass Effect and Halo. I'm not a you know I'm not a player of those games. Uh, mm-hmm. Nobody is going to pay me to write you know uh, tie-in fiction for Sid Meier's Civilization. 
Uh, <laughs> or, or, that, yeah. That's just world history. Well, you know, I mean, did or, you know what, what, what am I, what am I playing now? I'm playing snow runner, which is a, which is a, which huh? is a game where you're basically driving a four wheeler or, or a, uh, or a rescue truck through the mud in Michigan or the snows of Alaska. <laughs> it just gives me a chance to, you know, drive around in the, in the, in the snow without actually getting really stuck. Like I do here uh, in Wisconsin. <laughs> Very thing. niche game. Niche now this game. now none yeah. of this is to denigrate what happens in fan fiction at all. I never wrote any fan fiction, uh, but it was because I didn't know what it was, uh, and because I was a capitalist and I wanted to. When I was doing my own comics, I wanted to be able to sell those comics. Uh, I also knew I was a terrible artist, so if I drew Iron Man, it wouldn't look like Iron Man. <laughs> so I was drawing comics with ducks and rabbits and raccoons and cats. And, uh, you know, some, some of them sounded like Star Wars or felt like Star Wars. <laughs> I had Star Duck was one of my characters, Star Duck. But that's why I didn't, I didn't do that. You know, the, 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 the value of fan fiction is it, it gives you a chance to be read. It gives you a chance to have somebody, you know, read what you've done and communicate back to you how you did. Uh, did you successfully communicate your ideas? It gives you feedback. Mm. It toughens your skin in terms of criticism. You know, if you're working with multiple other people in a shared universe, you actually can get skills there uh, mm -hmm. where we're both writing about the same character at the same time. You get skills as far as air traffic control um, <laughs> and uh, and handling these things. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it's just understand the distinction, the delineation that, uh, you know, it's not the stuff that has the official imprimatur and, you know, getting to write that stuff uh, is not a direct path. That's a very comprehensive answer, honestly. I don't. Yeah. Like, you, you, might, you might think I've actually again. had to answer that before. Yeah, as a, as a person <laughs> yeah. who has not written fa in fan fiction, you've just educated me more about it than like anybody has. I, I don't read it. I'm not, but I know a lot of our listeners are big in the fan fiction world, so I appreciate the answer. John, I know you've uh, done a lot of podcasts recently. You've got more coming up in this promo. So my next few questions, I promise, have only one or two word answers. We're just going to rapid fire some some Star Trek. I don't know if I'm capable questions. of that. <laughs> we'll see. I'll talk fast. Uh, all right. Star Trek, Star Wars, or let's say Mass Effect. Which universe do you, John Jackson Miller, want to live in? Ooh. No, Star mm. Trek would be Star Trek would be more. See, I can't do the two word answers because you got to justify it. <laughs> you get 10 um, words. Yeah. yeah, Star Trek would be more fun because the transporter uh, it, mm -hmm. would give me a lot of time back. Unless it kills you every time. I still don't trust that transporter. Okay, uh, Star Trek, in the seasons where they figured out the transporter. <laughs> okay. Yes, <Okay>. yes. <laughs> Important distinction. Star Trek novels is known for their crossovers to have done X-Men, Doctor Who. If you could do a crossover of any two franchises, what would you want to do? Uh, if I could do a crossover between any two franchises, um, uh, it would be uh, Paul Dark and Horatio Hornblower. <laughs> All right, Ooh, you'd probably oh. get some Trek fans interested Man. in that. I think. Oh no, I, I uh, there there is a uh, there is a Napoleonic expanded universe out there to be had, uh, and and we'll throw in Aubrey and Maturin from uh, from the uh, Brian I was novels. Say, yeah, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, my my problem is. I know I can't write an O'Brien novel because I don't know all the parts of a ship the way he does. <laughs> Although I, I, like I can, that. I I think I could write a Hornblower novel because he's it's a little easier. Uh, favorite Strange New Worlds character to watch? I uh, have enjoyed uh, in the, in the first season watching Hammer because uh, Hammer is is really fascinating and and uh, we are actually working right now. I'm working with somebody who who knows Bruce Horak and we're going to try and get him a copy of the book. And and it was something where we we actually in the beginning we were figuring out where at least to set the beginning of the novel. Uh, Kirsten said, hmm. uh, "This guy's amazing. You you need to get Hammer in the book." And we did. <laughs> Don't do it after he dies. Uh, <laughs> favorites. Well, maybe How do you know good. you saw what you think you saw? Wow, oh, thank you. <laughs> are so cagey about this. Interesting. And if anybody asks, all I'm doing is quoting uh, is quoting Magneto from the first X Men movie. <laughs> Did you really see Bruce what you told us? You saw? They filmed Magneto the scene right. where they were bursting forth from his body. Now, it wasn't included in the final cut, so... <laughs> Favorite Strange New Worlds character to write? Well, Pike. Pike takes a good half of this book. Um, uh, and, do you yeah. like speeches? 
the fun thing about this book is it takes you know, we met we, we mentioned the maps but we didn't talk much about the book <laughs> yet um the, the the our our characters are all stranded on a planet with with no access to technology mm -hmm. and no way to escape and uh i put them in different places and um that's what reason that the uh you know the maps come in handy <laughs> it allows you to follow their journeys one of the things that I, I I spent as much time planning this book as I spent writing it. Oh, wow. One of the things that I, I worked at is, you know, we're going between Pike's story and these other people's stories, and we have to be able to follow all of them. And, you know, I have to get back to them in the right amount of time or not in the right amount of time for the reader to remember what's going on. It was, it was, it was like a musical notes. A B A C A B A C A B A C A D. Me going between the Pike story and the other mm -hmm. characters' stories and coming back. One reason the book took so long is I had a lot more characters trapped on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> like you mentioned with the musical notes, I'd, I'm near the point where D finally showed back up. I'm like, where the hell is? And I realized what's going on with that I, story. And, and, and no, I, I got through. Um, because again, the first uh, two drafts of the story were, uh, you know, first of all, it was it was it was many more than just A B C D. It was it was quite mm -hmm. a few more. The second the second go round, I I I put the characters in pairs that way. Oh, okay. and hmm. and and for the third go round, I said no. I'm going to go with two characters we know about. Uh, the main character, two characters we two characters we know about. And one character yep. we don't, ah. and uh, and that made it economical. Um, and that is the kind of stuff that uh, goes on in the plotting, the outline stage, and it's the kind of stuff I despise <laughs> because I want I want to write the action, I want to write the dialogue. Yeah. So you've taken the Enterprise crew and you've put them somewhere with no phones, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury is what you're saying is on this planet. A, a, uh, it's as primitive as can be. Uh, that is me catching your song cue there. Thank you, thank you. I, I, um, I could see that my co-hosts were not doing I, it, so I, I appreciate you doing it. Though. Well, yeah. no, the uh, the uh, actually Robinson Crusoe comes up a lot in the Enterprise War, um, see? and it's uh, it it should have told me something that the the sequel or the novel that Daniel Defoe wrote after the Enterprise War was the story of the plague year. Uh, so, or not Enterprise. After, after Robinson Crusoe, he wrote the story of the plague year. And right. okay. I'm like, oh no. Uh, and it, it turned out to be a plague year. Uh, yeah, not not that sequel. Yeah, not, yeah. not that sequel, but yes. It's a real life sequel. And so you're the, like, you know the, what? The, I want to do a cowboy thing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Do you want to give us a little uh, promo about the high country? Yeah, it comes out uh, February 21st in hardcover ebook and audiobook the audiobook read by robert petkoff it is uh the longest novel that i've written uh just <laughs> slightly longer than uh, the rogue elements book yeah again as i mentioned it is the first star trek novel since 2000 to have maps in it and so <laughs> so that is that is fun and these maps are the maps that uh are created by the uh inhabitants of the planets so Ooh, the, these are yeah. nobody should go in expecting that they're going to see L cars, you know, displays with <laughs> with with you know, with fancy stuff. Now this is what I came up with with the help of my friend, uh, the game designer. Uh, so so yes, that that comes out. Um, it is going to have a we have a launch event, uh, which is in Madison, Wisconsin, February twenty first. Uh, Barnes and Noble, the Barnes and Noble West Town, we're having an event there. Uh, the following weekend, I'm at the uh, Great Lakes Comic Con in Detroit. Uh, the weekend after that, I'm at Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle. And two weeks after that, I'm in GalaxyCon Richmond in Virginia. And uh, there are more events to come. Over the time that I've been doing Star Trek novels, when we started, we were doing mass market paperbacks. Then we went to trade paperbacks. Now we're doing hardcovers. Nice. And you're going to yeah. see them in places that you have not seen them before. And uh, so I want to keep that up. Yeah. Excellent. We've gotten uh, the cast and crew of Strange New Worlds to give us one word teases for season two. Is there a one word tease you could give us for the high country that won't spoil anything now? But when I read the book, I'll go, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> 
one word. One <laughs> word. I am not capable of I challenge you. A single uh, phrase. No, I was, uh, no, uh, no, fun is 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 what I'm going for with this. Fun. Uh, fun. Okay. But I, I'll I'll give you a phrase. Um, some people are going to look at this book and, and just right off the cuff and say it's a Western. It's not a Western. It's a science fiction novel with horses in it. I like it. I have a particle physicist who had helped advise me. I have a planetary scientist who helped advise me. And I have an equestrian advisor. Yeah. <laughs> this is definitely a Pike book. I like it. People who are looking for more information about my books can find me at farawaypress.com, uh, where I have notes on all the books or many of the books that I've written in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, JJM Faraway on Twitter, JJM Faraway on post.news, and uh, John Jackson Miller on Instagram and uh, Facebook. And then that uh, comics history website of mine is Comicron, C-O-M-I-C-H-R-O-N dot com. I also have a Twitter, a Facebook, and a Patreon for that. We've been talking tonight with John Jackson Miller, whose book, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, The High Country, is available today. As always, we want to keep every episode of Open Pike Night free to all. And to make that possible, please head over to patreon.com slash openpike or openpike.com. Our supporters have already had a video greeting from the recording and a post discussion after they enjoyed the episode. One of many benefits you too can have when you become a patron for as little as $2 a month. Jesse, how else can our listeners help? Well, John, before I get into how folks can help support Open Pike Night and keep it free, I just, I have to say thanks to the folks that have already done that because, of course, we are just getting back from our first ever live convention. We just had a blast at Fan Expo Portland 2023, and we could not have done that without you, so thank you. Now, of course, John is referring to our website, Open Pike. If you go to openpike.com, you can get everything all in one place. You can get our Instagram. You can get our Discord. You can get our Twitter. Those are all at Open Pike. You can also sign up for our newsletter so that you can be apprised of all the guests that are coming up as they are coming up. And, of course, if you go to openpike.com slash join us, you can record your 90 second audio clip right there and submit it to the show and cam where can people find more of you jesse is wearing his time crystal necklace right now because we were actually recording this before we go to our convention so he must have insights from the future speaking of time crystals i am the titular green shirt because they're green from green shirt a newbie struck through the next generation where you can hear me uh trying to avoid 30 year old spoilers or uh you know we're in season six you've probably heard this before check us out at green shirt 87 on twitter or wherever you're listening to this podcast and if i may there is nobody more titular than cameron <laughs> show me them titulars oh yeah and jesse where can folks find more of you <laughs> no that's staying <laughs> shit <laughs> If for whatever reason you need more of me in your ears, just stay in this podcasting app and search for Sudden But Inevitable. That's the podcast where I turn longtime friends into brand new fans of the shows I feel they probably should have seen by now. Shows specifically like Firefly, which our guest has a little bit of familiarity with, and shows like Cowboy Bebop. There's all kinds of space westerns in there. I have friends that hadn't seen Highlander. Can you even believe that? So if you like to hear people get forced to like stuff, check out Sudden But Inevitable. And I can be heard outside of either one of these, Green Shirt or Open Pike, most recently with the Green Shirt crew on Captain Picard Week 2. Go ahead and search for that on YouTube or the uh, Strange New Pod. We did a show about Captain Picard's biggest blunders. And uh, yeah, you know, for such a such a celebrated captain, he he messed up sometimes. Thank you all for being here tonight for our conversation with John Jackson Miller. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you get to crack open a good book soon. Don't forget to clean up after yourselves. Don't forget to tip your servers. You can go anywhere you want, but you can't stay here. Mm -hmm.